So now we have uh, Sarah Beasley with the Yurok tribe. use the microphone and never really spoke to an audience this big, so I'm a little shy, but my name is Sarah Beasley and I work as a fisheries biologist for the Yurok tribe. My co-presenters today are Earl Crosby, he's the watershed restoration coordinator for the Kuruk tribe, and then Taz Soto here is a fisheries biologist with the Kuruk tribe. Um, today, you know, our title of our talk is Tribal Fisheries Restoration Synergy. Taz kind of introduced me to that word, synergy. And I really do think that it, it applies um, when looking at the partnerships between the Karuk and the Yurok. And synergy is basically uh, multiple elements in a system that working together in a manner that produces an effect that's greater than the sum of the individual effects. Um, and that's definitely uh, what we like to um, see happening, especially in the restoration world. Um, Why don't you just help me? <laughs> so just for folks that aren't uh, aware of where these two tribes are located, the Karuk are centered in the um, mid-Klamath upstream of the Trinity River confluence there, and the Yurok people are centered on the lower river. Um, you know, both the Karuk and the Yurok have been relying on the resources of the Klamath River since time immemorial. It's really the lifeblood of these tribal nations and will continue to be. Um, both tribes really see themselves as integral parts of the ecosystem um, and will continue to be a part of those ecosystems forever. And I think that that's really, you know, the perspective that I really enjoy um, being a part of. I'm not a tribal member, but I do get to work with the, the Yurok tribe. And being, um, you know, a fisheries biologist with the Yurok, their, their long-term comprehensive sort of approach to resource management is just really um, amazing. And the dedication that these people have, you know, it's just so integrally tied to their cultural and spiritual and subsistence and economic livelihoods. And, and so, um, but unfortunately, as, oh, here. <laughs> As Lisa, you know, I think really capsulizes that, unfortunately, the Klamath River has had to do, endure a number of impacts, you know, from, you know, large-scale gold mining to historic logging and then a multitude of um, hydrologic alterations. And so the river is definitely um, in, a, in a state that needs some love and some help um, from us to get it back in, into that, uh, into a... a, a state that we can really produce those viable populations of salmon, you know, self-maintaining, robust populations. Um, go ahead. And so the two programs, both Karuk and the Yurok um, restoration programs, have a similar structure in the sense that we're working in watersheds from top to bottom, you know, treating upslope as well as in-stream, and then also looking at larger basin issues such as dam removal and other um, mechanisms to treat the whole basin. Um, we work in a very comprehensive, science-based, and prioritized manner in order to put these projects onto the ground. Um, both of our tribes have watershed programs that are dealing with the um, road-related and sediment-producing impacts in the watershed. Go ahead. And the goals of these work um, is definitely to minimize the erosion and sediment discharge from past land uses in a manner that protects and enhances aquatic and riparian habitats, brings back natural hydrologic patterns and vegetation patterns that are, are critical to healing these watersheds. And so while we have our watershed programs working on this upslope, you know, we have our fisheries program that are actively engaged in trying to restore the in-stream habitats for these fish. Uh, we're using, you know, watershed assessments, real-time fisheries monitoring information, and, and working in a prioritized manner to really build back the complexity that has been lost um, as a result of those um, land use practices. Um, I think one of the best uh, synergies that the, the Karuk and the Yurok are working together on is the Coho Ecology Study. And this is a, a project that we've been um, undertaking together um, with other partners since about 2006, studying the life history patterns of juvenile coho salmon. 
And so we're looking at things like, uh, you know, movement patterns, growth, survival, habitat use, things of that nature. And really that combination of the mid-Klamath folks doing the work up there and what we find in the lower river there, it's really um, brought so many things to light and that really has um, pushed that synergy into the restoration world. And so some of the key things that we've learned from studying the ecology of juvenile coho is that they really, they have a very strong affinity for slow velocity habitats like deep pools with complex wood accumulations, beaver ponds, off-channel habitats. And basically, as soon as the coho emerge from the gravel, they're actively seeking out these types of habitats. Um, we've even documented that they'll travel hundreds of miles in order to try to find these habitats. And so, you know, that was, it, it's work that's been done in Oregon and Washington, but to bring it here and, and to document the similar thing on the Klamath is really important. And what we've also learned is that survival and growth of these fish are definitely much greater when they can use these off-channel habitats prior to reaching the ocean. And we know that if you're bigger when you reach the ocean, you're more likely to come back as an adult. Go ahead. And so those, those concepts and that knowledge has really affirmed um, a lot of the in-stream restoration work that we, uh, the Karuk and the Yurok, are already um, doing on the landscape, such as, you know, introducing back large wood into these systems. But in about 2010, it also really kick-started um, a, a program to build back these off-channel habitats in priority areas throughout the mid and, and lower Klamath. Um, habitats so that these fish have more of these places to go to, that they're not having to travel, you know, hundreds of miles to find these places. We're trying to put them right there in their front yard so that, you know, they can move into those when they're young and stay there and grow big rather than trying to move up and down the, the Klamath system, which isn't always a, a very friendly place to be when you're a little juvenile coho. Um, and so this is a picture, these bottom pictures are a pond that we created in uh, Lower Turwer Creek. And since 2010, the Yurok, we've built six of these off-channel habitats in priority coastal drainages over the Lower Klamath. Um, this is what we call Turwer Pond B. And immediately when we constructed it, uh, we had hundreds of, you know, age one plus juvenile coho rearing in there. We even had hundreds of juvenile Chinook show up in the spring for a short amount of time prior to them migrating to the ocean. And it brings back that sort of field of dreams, um, you know, statement of you build it and they do come. And we've, we documented that fish, um, these juvenile coho were not only from Turwer Creek itself, but they were from born in tributaries from throughout the mid Klamath and even in the lower Klamath. In some cases, we had fish leaving what we thought was probably the most pristine creek in the lower Klamath to come down to Turwer Creek Pond B and, and raise up before they hit the ocean. Um, so that's really cool. This is a, a before and after shot of the first pond that we constructed in McGarvey Creek. This one is unique in the sense that it provides not only overwinter rearing habitat for these fish, but also summer rearing, which is critically important in the lower Klamath when a lot of our creeks do go subsurface in the summer. Um, since this time, we've built two more and plan to build a couple more in this um, system here because of the proximity to the ocean, the low gradient habitats, and the ability to both have winter and summer rearing in this watershed. We're really trying to maximize that as well. And so the Karuk, um, in coordination with the Mid-Klamath Watershed Council, they've built um, eight of these ponds and have several more in the planning phases since 2010. And this is a time series of um, Stender Pond, which was constructed in Syag Creek, one of their priority watersheds in the Mid-Klamath. And so um, just a little bit of orienting is um, I think that the outlet to the pond is here and you have Syad Creek flowing in the back here. So in the winter when the floods get up and moving and Syad Creek isn't always the best place to be, they can move into this pond and obviously, you know, this is low flow, but in the winter this thing is chock full with water and fish. And this is another shot of Alexander Pond, which was also constructed in the, in the Syad Creek. Um, similar thing where you have, you know, Syad running in the back here and they've constructed this beautiful little off-channel habitat here. Um, and so 
I think, you know, I, I, I really like to focus on, you know, sort of nuts and bolts of what we do restoration wise, but, you know, really, I think um, some of the themes that were brought up this morning with Marilyn, you know, some of your, um, your tips about how to, you know, build projects and how to get them on the ground and that it, it takes a village, you know, to, to conduct a project or maybe raise a child. Well, in this case, you know, it takes multiple villages to raise a salmon and to do it right. And we really are thankful to a, to a lot of our, our project um, partnerships a lot of these off-channel projects and even some of the wood loading that the Yurok are doing in the Lower Klamath um, are pushing that boundary of what's comfortable as far as restoration goes in California. And in order to do that, we've really had to build those partnerships and, and come together as a team when, when you've got, you know, uh, multiple tribes, you've got multiple um, private landowners, a lot of this work is being conducted on, the, on private land, and so bringing those landowners in, trying to build that trust and showing proof of concept, trying to drag the funding agencies along, some of them are more brave and want to give you funding, others are, are sort of lagging behind, but we're trying to get them to come to the table because you know, we've really demonstrated that these projects are effective at, um, you know, re rehabilitating our salmon populations. And so um, that's a key theme. And the other thing that we're really trying to do is rebuild our local economies. You know, the primary goals of this work are not only to restore the fisheries, but to provide, you know, high quality employment opportunities for tribal members bringing in uh, dollars into our local communities by um, using local vendors. You know, we rent a lot of heavy equipment, we buy a lot of fuel. So we try to do all of those purchasings and, and leasings from, you know, local companies as, you know, it's a big thing. And, and we really believe, as Lisa showed, that, you know, that this restoration salmon, you know, economy is what's gonna bring back these um, communities that live along the river. We're dependent on the river, you know, the tribes for their cultural and their subsistence and, and also their economic livelihoods. You know, I, I live on the Lower Klamath now and, you know, to see a lot of what used to um, keep the economies floating in these communities sort of fall to the wayside, such as logging and, and sport and commercial fishing is, um, is being revitalized in the sense of the restoration economy. And, and we're hoping that not only is it providing jobs now to our people, but that eventually we'll be bringing back enough salmon to re revitalize those river communities. You know, a lot of these communities relied on ecotourism, sport fishing, things like that, that drew them to our area. You know, it's a pretty isolated spot in Northern California. And so that's the ultimate goal, is to build back, you know, sustainable resource-based economies and feeling like, you know, that everybody is at that table together, multiple villages raising salmon. So with that, I, I thank you. <laughs>